Speaking of liberty, the National Broadcasting Company presents another in a special series of programs under the auspices of the Council for Democracy. There was free talk in the old New England town hall and around the Cracker Barrel and the Crossroads store. And there is free talk by free men every week at this same time on the air, led by our host, Rex Stout. Most of you already know Rex Stout as the author of the baffling mystery stories and the brain parent of the corpulent criminologist Nero Wolfe. On this program, we've grown to know him even better as an outspoken champion of our American democracy. Mr. Stout. Thank you, Lyle Van. Good evening, friends of liberty, friends of democracy. Are you one? The best way to test it, to test any man's claim that he is a lover of democracy, is to find out whether he approves and promotes democratic processes in his own business, in that branch of human affairs nearest and dearest to him. By that test, our guest today, John R. Tunis, gets as high a rating as anyone I know of. In the days when Mr. Tunis was a member of the sports staff of the old New York Evening Post, he condemned all attempts of snobbery and authority to restrict or restrain the right of boys and girls and men and women to play games, and he's never ceased to condemn them. For years, he has contributed articles on almost every kind of sport to many national magazines. He's written a number of books. Among them was College Worthwhile and Democracy in Sport. Tell us, Mr. Tunis, in what way can a sport be undemocratic? Well, in many ways, Mr. Stout. Well, give us an example. What sport? Any sport, any American sport. Well, take bowling, for instance. I take bowling because it's the greatest participating sport in the United States. Is that right? You mean more people bowl than play football? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, or baseball either. Bowling is the greatest participating sport in this country. By the way, Mr. Stout, when any sport has large numbers of people competing, it's pretty apt to be democratic. But let me explain exactly what I mean. At the last American Bowling Congress tournament, that's the American Bowling Congress, a team from Milwaukee won the championship. Next day, the tournament officials discovered that the members of the team were all Republicans and had voted for Wendell Wilkie at the last election. So what? Just this. They said Republicans shouldn't be allowed bowling titles. So they disqualified them and awarded the prize to the second team who were all good Democrats. What? Where have I been? In America? That isn't possible. Of course it isn't possible. That's exactly the point. A thing like that couldn't happen in the USA. It was all a story. Of course it didn't happen. But it has happened probably a good many times in totalitarian countries. I remember it happening in Nazi Germany not so long before war broke out. A member, or I guess it was several members of a prominent tennis club, which won a title, weren't good Nazis. The official in charge promptly declared the team was disqualified. They couldn't win. And he openly gave that reason that they weren't good Nazis? Absolutely. He said, and I'm using his words, only those who have mastered national socialist ideology can be victors in the Third Reich. Stop. Period. Unquote. By the way, Mr. Stout, you remember the man you had up here just one week ago tonight? You mean month? Douglas Miller, the former, com former commercial artist in mm -hmm. Berlin? That's right. Mr. Douglas Miller. His book is called You Can't Do Business with Hitler, isn't it? Yeah. Well, we might have called this broadcast You Can't Play Games Against Hitler. Well, we tried to. How about the Olympics? That's a good example. The last Olympic Games, which were held in August 1936, five years ago in Berlin, were the greatest demonstration of using sport for propaganda the world has ever seen. They weren't games, Mr. Stout, in any sense of the word. Their athletes weren't college boys like ours and the English competitors. Their athletes were trained servants of the state. Oh, they were. That's right. Some of those Germans had been training and working under government supervision and paid by the government for two or three years to prepare for this event. Not only did the government try its best at the games to sell the Nazi regime and National Socialism to every visitor and especially to those in the press box, but it showed plainly that it considered sport merely another branch of military training. Sport wasn't fun. Sport wasn't healthy recreation. Sport was propaganda. If you won, sport was training youth for war. Why, every... Well, I remember there was an argument about that, even before they went. That's right, but they didn't do anything about it. It happens that in my files today is a release from the American Olympic Committee shortly after the Germans went into the Rhineland. you remember that, Mr. Stone? Yeah, that was in March, 1936. Uh-huh. Just after the Winter Olympics at Garmisch Partenkirchen. Here's the way that release from the American Olympic Committee reads, quote, The fundamental rule of the International Olympic Committee is to ignore racial, religious, and political affairs as much as possible. If they did not adhere to this policy, the games would never be held, as the world is always torn by controversies of various kinds. In other words... In other words... The badges of the American Olympic... Badges? Committee. What are they? 
Well, <laughs> I suppose I ought to explain. That's a sports writer word, badges. It means the gents who wear badges, the officials, those gentlemen who seem to infest all our sports today. These gentlemen, and yes, I suppose we ought to admit it, the athletes, too, over in this country, they felt that this Nazi thing wasn't important enough to make a fuss about. I don't recall a single athlete or a single American badger who refused to go to Germany. See, they all wanted a trip. We were much more interested in joy rides in those days than in fundamental principles such as democracy and sport. By the way, there was only one newspaper man or American radio commentator at Berlin who had the nerve to say, hey, wait a minute, this thing's a racket. Who was that, Mr. Tunis? Westbrook Pegler. There must have been a hundred American sports commentators and, and radio men there at the time, and he was the only one, Westbrook Pegler was the only one who spoke his piece, who showed up this racket of sport. Well, of course, anything can be a racket. When sport is sport and not a racket, what is sport? Well, Mr. Stout, for my book, sport is a game or some form of physical exercise done for the fun of it because it gives one pleasure. Now, it's obvious that democratic sport is something in which the masses can participate and enjoy. The Rose Bowl games, heavyweight championship bouts? No, emphatically not. Those things aren't sport at all. They're business, sometimes big business, but business and entertainment always. The people who watch these events have a good time, get relaxation, but there aren't any more sportsmen than the Emperor Nero. Well, all the same, Mr. Tunis, some of the people competing on Rose Bowl teams or Davis Cup teams come under your definition. They enjoy themselves, don't they? Mm-hmm. They do. I'll admit that. But just the same, it isn't democratic sport. It's privileged sport. Sport for the few. Few boys. I have a lot of money spent on them. They're coached, trained, fed, transported. Now, that isn't democracy. Sport for too long has been for the few instead of the many in this country. Take a simple thing like like ocean swimming, like, like uh, bathing in the ocean, for instance. You know what an enormous coastline we have in this country, Mr. Sure, South. thousands of miles. That's right. Did you know that in 1939, according to the Department of Agriculture, only 1% of that coastline was open to the public? I'll give you another instance where democracy fails in American sport. Name me the best Negro pitcher in the American League. The be I'm not that ignorant in sport. Even John Kieran couldn't name him. Of course not. There aren't any. The leagues, both of them, are largely filled up with players from the South. Anyhow, there isn't any Negro player in organized big league baseball. As far as I know, none in professional football either, and mighty few in college football. Last spring, in fact, the Harvard lacrosse team went down to play the Navy at Annapolis with a Negro player. I believe I'm right in saying they had to remove him before the Navy would agree to compete. By the way, this Negro question in sport is well treated by one of our colleagues, Mr. Kurt Reese, in an article in the new issue of the National Monthly Magazine, which is coming out tomorrow. It's called, May the Best White Man Win. Good title. Yeah, it is a good title. You see what I mean uh, when I talk about the need for democracy in sport? I get a hint. What can be done about it? Well, lots of things. We can demand, those of us who do really believe in democracy, that everyone gets a square deal in sports, as in other spheres of American life. We can see that every citizen in this country has a chance to play. Now, here's one place where the government has taken a hand. Even before the draft, lots of people realized too many Americans were unhealthy and undeveloped. Since 1935, the WPA, the CCC, and the NYA have spent over three quarters of a billion dollars on sport. And I mean real sport, not the Rose Bowl kind. Did you say three quarters of a billion? That's right, Mr. Stout. Seven hundred and seventy-seven million to be exact. Ouch. Did we get our money's worth? Well, there's some dispute about that. I think we did. We've been giving health to people who need it. We've built public golf courses. Incidentally... One of the finest golf courses in this country, public or private, is out at the Best Page State Park at Farming in Long Island. And we've conducted swimming pools, public beaches, camping sites, tennis, handball, and shuffleboard courts. By the way, that reminds me of a definition of democracy I heard the other day. What was it? It came from a young boy about to be drafted. They asked this boy what democracy meant to him. What did he say? He said, Jones Beach. <laughs> I've heard worse definitions. You bet. And in more wordage. But let me tell you what else has been done for democratic sport in this country in recent years. The WPA, the CCC, and the NYA have built about a thousand skating rinks, 300 miles of ski trails, bobsled runs, and winter sports areas, all free. What's more, they use these facilities. Over 600,000 golfers used the public golf courses around New York in 1940. That same year, 38 million Americans, think of that, Mr. Stout, 38 million visited our national parks and forests. They climbed mountains. They walked on trails. They fished and camped out. 
Maybe, I know, some of them only whiz through and afford, but they all got outdoors, see? That's what I mean when I try to talk about democracy and sport. Well, I agree with you, Mr. Tunis. It's democratic, all right. It's a fine thing. But a lot of people say that in times like these, when we have to watch pennies, a billion dollars for sports facilities comes close to being a luxury. They say we can't afford that sort of thing. What do you say to them? Well, I say to them we can't afford not to have this sort of thing. Because this new recreation program is helping make America strong. It's building up the hearts and bodies of millions of our people. It's a living proof that the democratic way of life does mean a richer and fuller existence for our children. You know, Mr. Stout, you can't ask people to risk their lives in battle unless they've got something to fight for. This is one thing, I know it may be a small thing, but it's an important thing. Democratic sport, recreation for the many, not the few. Games for the millions, not the carriage trade. I don't call a program of that sort a luxury. Do you, Mr. Stout? I call it a real necessity of our fight to make democracy endure. Well, so do I, Mr. Tunis. I'm for it. Too many people have considered public recreation as boondoggling or something to keep a few thousand jobless boys busy in the woods. They don't realize what it has done for millions of Americans. And another thing. There's a good deal more to the problem of sport and democracy than the physical side. There's a spiritual side, too. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean that there's something in sports and games which gives a nation spiritual qualities. Look what it gave the English. They're a games-playing nation. It showed those people the validity of such things as duty, team play, cooperation. You mean that the qualities of character that make a boy a valuable member of a cricket team or a baseball team also make a man a valuable citizen of a democracy? Exactly. More than that, the field of sport is the place where those qualities of character can be most easily developed. Through sport, we can teach democratic behavior in practice. We can show boys and girls where their acts offend the democratic principle. However, the fans cheer Leo DeRocher when he gets kicked out of a baseball game with the umpires. Well, of course, Major League Baseball isn't sport from my book. Coming back to my definition, baseball is big business. I'm thinking of another sort of game. It's a game I saw, a game of basketball played last winter in a country high school where two boys the same age as the players were acting as referees. Another boy was the timer. Another boy was the scorer. Wasn't there a coach? Sure, there was a coach, all right but he simply wasn't running the game. He was a teacher of physical education, so he stood on the sidelines and left the game entirely in the hands of the players themselves. They chose their officials, and through that, they come to learn that if they don't live up to the rules, the game disintegrates. I've seen that game, Mr. Stout, and there are millions of them taking place all over the United States. Now, here's an excellent example of dynamic democracy. We need the spirit of democratic sport in this country. And one way, in my, my opinion, one way to get that spirit of democratic sport in this country is to have more and more people playing games, to give equal opportunity to all groups and classes of our citizens. Because the more we play games, play, mind you, not watch, the more we learn to apply the principles of cooperative living to our exercise and our recreation, just so much stronger and tougher we knit the fibers of our democracy. Seems to me, today we need the spirit of sport in our democracy and the spirit of democracy in our sport. Thank you, Mr. Tunis. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest today is John Tunis. This is Rex Stout saying goodbye until next week. You've just heard the 18th of a series of programs entitled Speaking of Liberty, brought to you each week by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with the Council for Democracy, a national organization dedicated to the propagation of an American faith in democracy. Next week, Rex Stout will bring Jay Allen to the microphone. A copy of the script of this broadcast will be mailed free to anyone requesting it. Please address your letter or card to the Council for Democracy, 285 Madison Avenue, New York City. Speaking of Liberty has been presented as a public service by the National Broadcasting Company and the independent radio stations associated with the Red Network of the National Broadcasting Company.